My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, I give thanks to my God in heaven for the faith given to you by the power of the Holy Spirit this day. Amen. A blessed Monday Thursday to all. In some ways, Monday Thursday could be called Blood Thursday. Now I know that doesn't sound good. That is not something that is pleasurable to the ears. But in fact, it is true. There are many instances on Thursday of Holy Week that surround themselves around blood. In fact, the epistle lesson, the very last verse, reads as follows. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. We know that Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, the Bible tells us, prayed so vigorously to his Father that blood droplets formed. We know that there, reclining at the meal, the celebration of the Passover, where Jesus instituted the new meal, that blood was a centerpiece as well. Now I know, while I'm not advocating to change the liturgical day from Monday Thursday to Blood Thursday, I do think there is significant theological implications to our understanding of what this day is all about. Let me take you back some 2,000 plus years to that night where Jesus reclined with his disciples at the meal. At that time, they were gathering together to celebrate the Passover by way, another meal centered around blood. The Passover in the Old Testament was that celebration where the Israelites enslaved in Egypt were commanded to paint the blood of the lamb over their posts, the doorposts. And the angel of death would pass over their home. Blood, significant then as it is now in the life of the church were there at that Passover meal, Jesus instituted the new meal, his body and blood, in with and under the bread and wine, for the forgiveness of sins for us Christians to eat and to drink. Once again, however, reclining at that meal, relaxed, feeding oneself with good food, Jesus interrupts the meal. Picture it, if you will. Jesus, the very Son of God, the leader of the disciples, the one that just four short days ago, the people of Jerusalem, as Jesus came down the Palm Sunday road, shouted Hosanna to the King. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And now Jesus, that same man, reclining at the meal, celebrating the Passover, announces to his disciples the men he loves, the men who were with him every day of his life and ministry, one of you will now betray me. Now we know the implication of that announcement meant the shedding of Jesus' blood. But picture being there at that table, reclining comfortably with the Messiah, having the institution of the new sacramental meal, where, by the way, as the Old Testament says, blood still must be shed, Jesus makes this announcement. Hear what the text says. Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were very sorrowful. That is what the biblical text tells us that the disciples felt when Jesus made this announcement. And I have to tell you, putting myself in the place of a disciple at least one of the 11 who were not going to betray him, I understand. The sorrow that they must have felt that Jesus was saying, one of these trusted brothers will now betray me. We, in the church today, know the story. We know that Judas' betrayal was part of the ongoing salvific plan of our Father in heaven. That is to say, Jesus being the sacrificed lamb. But the 11 who were sorrowful, the Bible accounts for, but the one who was not, 
He diverts the attention by making the question known to Jesus. Is it I, Lord, Judas said to Jesus, making it seem as if it's impossible for Judas to be the one. We know, biblically speaking, that the plan was already hatched. In fact, it would only be a few short minutes after the meal where Jesus departed to Gethsemane to pray that Judas went to Caiaphas' house to enact the plan. And Jesus simply answers Judas, it is as you've said. You see, for many, the concept of Judas deflecting the attention from the other 11, and I've thought many times in my pastoral life, what must the other 11 been thinking that night, at that meal, when Jesus said that? What must the other 11 been thinking when this declaration happened? But it didn't stop simply there. Because Jesus went on to say something that we don't talk much about on Monday, Thursday. These are the words he spoke. To Judas directly, but to the world. Woe to that man whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not even been born. Think about that. This is the declaration that Jesus, the Son of God, made in the hearing of Judas, the one who will simply rise up from the meal, go the opposite way from Jesus, away from Gethsemane, to the house of Caiaphas, to put in motion that which we know as the final hours of the life of the Messiah. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, it is very clear that the theme of blood and the shedding of blood is a key component to all of Holy Week, but specifically to this night as we celebrate the gift that Christ gives to the church in his body and blood, in, with, and under the bread and wine. As Jesus finishes this meal, as the interchange with Judas occurs, as Christ makes the woe to Judas that it would be better if he was not even born, Jesus rises from the meal, takes with him Peter, James, and John, goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. And having been recently in the Garden of Gethsemane, I have to tell you, a tranquil place, a place at the bottom of the ridge and the valley of the Mount of Olives, about a half a mile to a mile away from the home of Caiaphas, Jesus intensely prays to his father to find a new way, Father, because Jesus knows that the plan of salvation is in full motion. Jesus knows that his bloodshed is yet to come. The intensity of this prayer, as scripture reminds, does garner droplets of blood. Jesus knows that his shedding of blood is imminent. And yet there in the Garden of Gethsemane, a tranquil place, a calm place, the tumult of the world rests on the shoulders of the Messiah. As he sees Judas and the soldiers with their torches coming down to Gethsemane, knowing that they were coming for him, Woe to the man who would betray the Son of God. Jesus could have easily, my friends, gotten up over the Mount of Olives and out into the desert outside of Jerusalem in about 10 to 15 minutes. Without being touched, without being captured. But remember the words that Jesus spoke that night. Not my will, but thine be done. The words of our Savior, knowing that his own blood would be shed in the shortcoming hours. The Savior, the Son of God, the one who did what we could not, stood, knowing that the betrayer Judas was on his way. Knowing that at the hands of the soldiers, his physical torment would begin. Knowing 
that less than 24 hours from that point, Jesus would rest from his physical labors on this earth in death. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, hear these words from the epistle lesson in Hebrews. He entered Jesus once for all into the holy place, not by means of the blood of the goats or the calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing eternal redemption. Not by the blood of the calves or the goats or the doves or the bulls, but his own precious blood secured for us eternal redemption. Now the Old Testament sacrificial system was still at the point of this in the life of the church in play. But now we hear these continued words in Hebrews. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, Jesus the sacrificed lamb, gave himself through bloodshed for you and for me. Let this unique, in some ways special, Monday Thursday, where many of us worship at our homes, away from the fellowship of believers here in the congregational setting of the church, be reminded of the truth of Monday Thursday where the shedding of blood is the centerpiece of sacrifice, forgiveness, and ultimately, as Hebrews said, the redemption of God's people. Let that be your joy. Let that be your motivation. And let that be that which carries you through this entire frustrating part of our lives. Short as it may be, remembering the frustrations looking into the face of Christ and knowing through his blood we have redemption and forgiveness. In that great joy we say, Amen. May God the Father who gives us the great gift of his Son, may God the Son who gives us the great gift of his life and death, may God the Holy Spirit continue to bless, guide, lead and strengthen you this day, now and forevermore. Amen.